All right. Well, thank you. Um, very quickly, it, he already gave a bit of a, a brief description of myself. Um, I have been doing Agile for a very long time. I got started in 1999 with XP and then went on to Scrum and Kanban and a bunch of other things. So I've been doing this for a very long time. And as I am working as a coach, I find that there's three main buckets of things that I do. And the first is sort of skills training. I, I skill people up, whether it's technical skills or how to write good stories or how to do things, but it's all skills training. The second big bucket of things is process improvements. How do we get better at our process? And that could be Scrum or Kanban or, or whatever it is that we're doing to adjust it. And the third big bucket is all this messy people stuff. Why do people do the things they do? What can we motivate people? How do we, how do we understand people better and how do we get the best out of them? And traditionally, that last area, all that messy people stuff was my weakest area. So I made a deliberate effort starting about six years ago to get better at this people stuff. What can we do to, to understand why people do the things they do? And that's taken me on the craziest and most fascinating journey into neuroscience, psychology, hypnosis, body language, and a whole bunch of other things. And everything we're going to talk about tonight comes from those worlds. So our, our rough agenda for, for this evening, we're going to talk a little bit about what psychological safety is, because it may not be as straightforward as what you thought it was. There are multiple different angles we can look at it. Uh, we're going to talk about, for a moment, why do we care about this? Why is psychological safety important to the things that we are doing as we're going on on our day-to-day -day basis? Then we're going to dive into the, the real reason you're here. What's actually going on in our brains? What are those things that we know from a, a neuroscience perspective about what's going on and why is that important? Then I'm going to introduce the safety model, which comes from the brain-based leadership organization, which is a way of looking at psychological safety from six different perspectives. And we're going to talk a little bit about the neuroscience behind those. And then after I've been talking for a while, we're going to get into breakout rooms. And we're going to start talking about applying some of this. How could we use these ideas and in uh, things that we could do to take back to our offices? So that, in a nutshell, is what we're going to be doing. If at any time you have questions, please just stop me. Um, I, unfortunately, I can't see you, so you'll just have to unmute and speak up because uh, I can't see the cameras as we're presenting in this way. So what is psychological safety? Amy Edmondson, when she first coined this, this term, psychological safety, was talking about a very specific observable behavior. She was studying uh, research or medical uh, mistakes. So medication mistakes, when you go into a hospital and she would look at, did people get the right medication? Did they get the wrong medication? Were the dosages right or wrong? And she was looking at medication problems. And this is where she came up with all of her research on psychological safety. She started digging into it and she realized that it was a very specific observable behavior that when people felt safe, they would step up and say, hey, I think we have a problem here. They would speak up when they thought them the dosage was wrong. They would speak up if they thought that it, a doctor would, had made a mistake. And so we could, we could do this, but it, the reverse was true that if they were feeling unsafe, they would stay quiet, even if they saw something that they felt was a mistake. So psychological safety was this observable behavior that people would step up and correct mistakes when they observed them and if we didn't have psychological safety, they wouldn't. Well, that seems fairly straightforward. It's an observable behavior. But it turns out that when we dig into it deeper, that's only one of three different ways that we can look at this. So uh, Victor Sisan has written an awesome article, which I will link later. All of the citations that I have here are on a slide at the end. Uh, so you will have links off to everything. Uh, but he wrote this in really interesting article where he talks about the three different lenses through which we can look at psychological safety. And the first one is what I just talked about. It's what Amy Edmondson first identified. And it was the safety to act, the belief that one will not be punished or humiliated for speaking up with ideas, questions, concerns, or mistakes. These are her words. So it was all about safety to act. But then as we dig deeper into the psychology, we find that it's more than just safety to act. It's actually safety to be. So that I can show my true self. I can show who I am and what's going on. And this is the psychological perspective. So this is a different lens that we can use to look at psychological safety. Not just safe to act, but safe to be. 
But thirdly, there is another area, another definition that we can have that comes from the neuroleadership organization, where we're talking about psychological safety being that state in which we have access to our prefrontal cortex. Prefrontal cortex is a very specific part of our brain having to do with higher level reasoning, higher level thinking. Uh, it's also that part of our brain that can sort of override our emotional states. So if we're in a, a deep emotional state, the prefrontal cortex can somewhat override that to get us to do the right thing. If the prefrontal cortex is inhibited, then we are reacting more than thinking through things. So we have these three very different definitions, different ways of looking at things safety to act, safety to be, and access to the prefrontal cortex. And yet all three of them together are the essence of psychological safety. What I'm focusing on tonight is more that third one. It's that neurological state where we're talking about the prefrontal cortex. So she, Amy Edmondson does have this, this awesome uh, TED talk. I'm not gonna show it tonight, but there will be a link to it. And I would encourage you to go and, and take a look at it. She talks about how she came across this in the first place, all about the, the medical teams that she was working with and how she discovered this and how she's found that it, it layers out to, to other kinds of industries. It's not just about medical mistakes. But we have another completely different example. The, the cargo ship El Faro was a, a fascinating example of a story. It's a ship, a cargo ship that sunk in the middle of a hurricane uh, back in 2015. And it doesn't seem like this would be a psychological safety issue. And yet we know what happened on that ship because we have full audio transcriptions of everything that happened up on the bridge. And David Marquet, in this excellent book, Leadership is Language, decomposes the language that was used on the bridge, talking about the things that the captain said to the crew, the things that the crew said in response, that are all deeply interconnected with psychological safety. The crew did not feel safe to speak up and say that they had a problem. There were multiple opportunities that the ship had to turn out of the course of the storm, but the captain felt it was safe and the language the captain used uh, made it unsafe for anybody else to speak up. And the result, of course, was that the ship went down with all 33 members on board. So really interesting example of psychological safety in safety. So we've talked about medical mistakes, and now we've talked about a, a cargo ship that went down. These are life or death situations we're talking about. But how is this relevant to software development? Because we're typically not doing life or death decisions. Now, I know that's not always true. Some of us do write software for pacemakers. Some of us do write software for autonomous cars. Some of us are doing things that are, are actual life and death situations, but most of us are not. So why do we care about psychological safety in a software development space? Well, that's interesting. It turns out that Google a number of years ago went and did this study uh, that they call Project Aristotle, to find out why some of their teams were so effective and some of their other teams were not. Because they've got massive numbers of teams and some of them just drastically outperformed others. And when they started this study to figure out what was going on with teams, what they assumed would happen is that they would find out that the teams that were outperforming the others had better people on them, higher skills, uh, better education. They had better access to tooling, perhaps. There were, there were things that they expected to find, but that isn't what they found at all. What they found is that the number one factor for high-performing teams was, in fact, psychological safety. In fact, the top five things that attributed to the highest-performing teams had nothing to do with tooling or skills or age or education of the people on the teams. The top five items were these, psychological safety, dependability, structure and clarity, meaning and impact. It's a phenomenal study and I would encourage you to go and take a look at the results of Google's Aristotle. They've, I understand they've run this a number of times since then, but they did this initially back in 2015 and they got these results showing psychological safety was the number one factor. So even when we're doing something that is not life or death, psychological safety has a key a direct effect to the productivity and the effectiveness of our teams. So that's why we care about it. So a couple of disclaimers, first of all, before we get into this, the entire field of neuroscience is only about 50 years old. 
um, we are still learning. We're still discovering things. We're still learning. If we look back through human history at any point in time where we thought we knew all the answers to things, for most of the things that we thought we knew, we were wrong. So it's quite likely that 20 years from now, we'll look back at the things I'm talking about tonight and say, yeah, a lot of that was wrong. But what we know today, what we believe to be true today is what I'm presenting to you now. This is, as far as I know, the most current information about the neuroscience of what's going on. But I do just want to put out that disclaimer that the whole field is actually pretty new. We're still discovering things all the time. The second disclaimer is that these texts are going to be very text heavy. Um, although I don't personally like that style of presentation, I'm doing this because I feel it's really important that not being a neuroscientist myself, that I be able to back up any claims I make. So if I am making a statement to you about this is how the brain works, I should be able to cite references and show you research papers and books from neuroscientists that back up everything I'm saying. I feel that's an important point, and that's why you're going to see a lot of text here, because it's backing up all the points that I'm talking about. I'm not going to read the slides. That would be horribly boring for both of us, you and me. So here we go. So back to our definition from the Neural Leadership Organization, psychological safety is a neurological state in which we have access to our prefrontal cortex. So this is higher level rational thinking, it's able to override the emotional response. And this is what we typically refer to as the human brain or the human part of our brain because we share so much of the, the brain uh, layout and, and organization uh, is shared with other mammals and in fact with other animals. But the, the prefrontal cortex is sort of what makes us that human. So when that shuts down and we're just in a reactive state, that's when we don't have psychological safety. So let's talk a little bit about fear because we've got, we talk about psychological safety and safety being a key thing. Well, this is all tied into our survival mechanism. The amygdala is the first part of our brain that looks for detect potential danger. This is part of our survival mechanism. It's a little piece of our brain that's about halfway back on the underside on both sides of our brains. And it's designed to detect potential danger. It, it, it will identify when something might be dangerous, but it might not be. So the amygdala is, it, it's our early warning sign. Here's something that might be a problem. We better do something about that. When the amygdala goes off, it triggers one of two different responses. It triggers either a mobility response, which is fight or flight, or it triggers a freeze response, which is shutting down entirely. The two different responses, according to polyvagal theory, come from very different points in our evolution. The freeze response is part of a very ancient uh, response that we share with reptiles and with, with other animals. The mobility response is, part, is shared with mammals. So other mammals also have a fight or flight response, but non-mammals typically don't. They only have a freeze response. So we have both. And it's unclear to science exactly which one we're going to react with at any given time. So we can't say, well, this situation is always gonna give you a fight or flight, and this situation is always gonna give you a freeze. We don't know that yet. We, we don't have enough criteria to establish that. But we do know that you're gonna do one of the two. And in either case, our prefrontal cortex is inhibited. So let's just quickly talk through them. In the case of a mobility response, this is fight or flight, our mammalian response. When I detect that there might be some kind of a danger, I might see a snake on the path in front of me, or I might just have my boss give me a deadline. My brain can't really distinguish between those two things, but it detects that there's a potential danger. So for a mobility response, it activates my sympathetic nervous system, which in turn goes and activates a whole bunch of other things. It starts pumping adrenaline through my body to prepare me for fight or flight. Okay, my lights are flickering here. Hopefully I don't lose the connection. We appear to be having a storm going through. So the, the, the sympathetic nervous system fires off. It triggers adrenaline, gets us ready. Uh, we start getting ready for that fight or flight. We start pumping glucose into our muscles. We generate all kinds of things, getting us ready for that, that fight or flight response. Uh, at the same time, because this is so energy intensive, we find that we, free, we try to free up energy from other sources. So our brains shut down things that are considered non-essential. So for example, we stop growing. 
our fingernails stop growing and our hair stops growing because growth is not necessary in a survival situation. We also shut down our immune system because the immune system, again, is for long-term health. It's not for short-term health. So in a mobility response, fight or flight, we shut our immune systems down. But the last one that's really interesting is that we shut down the prefrontal cortex because during that mobility response, we don't need to think our way through it. It's not a math problem to be solved. We need to respond and we need to respond quickly. And so the mobility response, when that sympathetic nervous system is activated, shuts down our prefrontal cortex. Now let's look at the freeze response. The freeze response is quite different from a mobility response. It doesn't go through the sympathetic nervous system at all. It goes directly into, uh, well, into our, our vagal response system. And when we, we freeze, we start to, sh to shut down. Our heart rate slows, we breathe slower. It's a, it's a much more shut down situation. And this works great in reptiles because reptiles don't actually need to breathe as often as we do. But when a mammal, or specifically a human in this case, goes into a full freeze response, now we've restricted the amount of oxygen that's going to our brains. And as we restrict that oxygen, our prefrontal cortex is now compromised. So in either case, whether we went through a mobility response or we went through a freeze response, we are now uh, inhibiting our prefrontal cortex. Mike? Uh, yes. Uh I think your mic is, yeah, we're getting a lot of static or background noise. I'm, I'm afraid I have a nasty storm outside right now, uh, okay. so that's probably what you're hearing. All right. No worries. Keep going. I should not have scheduled the storm. Bad, bad <laughs> planning. Um, so while we're in this mobility response, uh, this fight or flight, we react very poorly. Uh, we tend to misread social cues. Uh, in particular, we start to see people who are not angry appearing as if they were angry. And when those people become angry, that in turn um, makes us more susceptible. We become angry and that makes us more susceptible to false or misleading. This is quite the storm out here. Um, I hope you can still hear me okay. So the next one is that we are distracted by potential dangers and are less capable of following business conversations. What, what this means is our, in our middle ear actually tunes and it changes to amplify low frequency sounds because predators, when they're coming through the forest towards us, tend to make low frequency sounds. So we our ear tunes to be more receptive to low frequency sounds while tuning out high frequency sounds. And of course, something that we all have in a business setting that is a high frequency sound is human voice. So now we are actually less capable of hearing human voice because our ear has just tuned itself. Uh, lastly, we are less capable of effective problem solving uh, because all, all of these things that we're talking about getting ready for that mobility response is using up oxygen and glucose, which are in turn needed for creative insight, analytical thinking, problem solving, and short-term memory. All of those things are kind of important in the business context and they all shut down. So the moment we get into that place of, of fear, we're getting, again, we, we lack psychological safety. So we're getting into that place of fear and all of these things are going on. So we're reacting poorly, we're heavily distracted and we're less capable of problem solving. Lastly, we tire really easily. So one of the things that's going on when when we're ramping up for this mobility response and we're getting adrenaline going through our body, we have another uh, neurochemical called noradrenaline that goes through our brain and then noradrenaline helps us focus. It gets us really focused all the time, but keeping it going all the time also gets us tired really quickly. So we tire very easily from all of this. Uh, and then in generally the prefrontal cortex being a newer part of the brain can get tired faster. And so as we get tired, of course, now we are less capable of handling things. And so we get even into a, a deeper place of lack of safety. And of course, because, you know, we, we've had all this bad news, it does get worse. If we are constantly in the mobility response, if we're uh, low levels of anxiety on a regular basis or even high levels of anxiety, if we're, we're stressed all the time, the, the research shows that the, our hippocampus, which is responsible for a lot of memories and such, actually begins to disintegrate. 
Uh, we're also constantly flooding our body with cortisol, another neurotransmitter, which although it's phenomenal in a survival situation, it gives us energy, it makes us want to respond, it makes us want to, to go and do something. It also suppresses the immune system, increases blood pressure and blood sugar levels and decreases learning abilities. And of course, the, the last one is that when we are in prolonged stress, the amygdala actually gets stronger. And the stronger the amygdala gets, the faster it reacts, and the, the faster it reacts, the more we go back into either a mobility response or a freeze response. So this is all really, really bad news. But there is some good news. So the good news is that there is another neurotransmitter called oxytocin, often called the bonding chemical, that has the effect of suppressing the amygdala. So when we, our brains start to generate a bit of oxytocin, then the amygdala starts to calm and we are less likely to go into that state where the prefrontal cortex is shut down. So where do we get oxytocin from? Well, our brains naturally generate it in certain circumstances. If a uh, human touch, or actually touch with, with any mammal, doesn't have to be human, if I'm cuddling with my cat, I'm getting a shot of oxytocin. And because this is common to all of mammals, my cat is also getting a shot of oxytocin. So we're starting to get this, we're both calming down. So human touch, a sense of belonging, um, all these sorts of things just get us in a better place. So if we're working together, if we're actively pair programming or mob programming, we're starting to build up some of that oxytocin, which helps to calm the amygdala, which gets us to a better place. Uh, if we're doing workshops or exercises of some kind, one place that's phenomenal for generating oxytocin is laughter. If we can get everybody laughing, then we get a whole flood of chemicals. We get dopamine and endorphins and serotonin and a whole bunch of other things, but we also get a good shot of oxytocin, particularly if it's a good laugh. If I can just get somebody to smile a little bit, I get a tiny shot of oxytocin. But if we get a good belly laugh, we get a lot of oxytocin. Again, the more oxytocin we get, the calmer the amygdala is gonna get. The calmer the amygdala is, the more psychologically safe we're gonna to begin to feel. All right, so now let's get to the safety model. The safety model comes from the Brain-Based Leadership Organization. Um, I read about it first in this book, which is a, a great book. I really enjoyed it. And it is six different ways into which we can view psychological safety. And there's, there's neuroscience bits in behind each of these six, but we're gonna look at the six and we're gonna walk through them. But before we do that, before we get into them, I do wanna call out the fact that we're all gonna react differently. No two people are gonna respond exactly the same way, whereas we see all kinds of variations. Um, this quote up at the top from Stephen Porges, he's the, the main guy behind polyvagal theory, brilliant neuroscientist, uh, going in and doing all kinds of interesting stuff. And he talks about all of the variations that are going on. So we might find that some people have a really high need for security, but a lower need for autonomy. So we, there's no single thing that we can say, well, if you just do this with your teams, everybody will be better because we're all different. So we do need to recognize that no single right answer that will work with everybody. All right, first one is security. And security is the brain's need for predictability. Predictability is a really interesting thing because if we look at how we have evolved as humans or just as animals in general, um, we have evolved to be highly effective prediction mechanisms. Uh, and the, the book, Seven and a Half uh, Lessons About the Brain, uh, which is a fabulous book, goes into great depth about how we evolved towards this. I read a lot of neuroscience books and this is the only one that's ever made me laugh out loud. Seven and a Half Lessons About the Brain, fabulous book. Uh, but she talks about how we have evolved for predictability. And security is all about wanting that predictability. We want to know what's coming. We want to be able to successfully predict the future because that's what keeps us alive. And everything we're talking about here is part of our security. It's our survival mechanism. So we want consistency, we want commitment, we want certainty, and we want no change, the four C's of, of security. So I just mentioned this, uh, our brains have evolved to be highly effective pr uh, prediction engines, although counterintuitively, we actually like a bit of novelty too. So novelty has its place. Novelty brings out a lot of creativity. It does a lot of very positive things, but from a, a survival mechanism perspective, novelty can be dangerous. 
anything that is unfamiliar, that is new, that can be a danger. And if I'm already in a place of stress or I'm already feeling psychologically unsafe, too much novelty can be a real problem. So we do like some novelty, but we want it in small doses. So security, this is uh, referring back to the book uh, by David Marquet, where he's talking all about the language that we use. This is critically important in a business setting, that the way we phrase things can make the difference between triggering the amygdala or not. We've all had that situation where, where the boss says, can you come and talk to me in my office? And we have no context. We don't know what's going on. And all of a sudden, we're starting to feel a little bit unsafe because we don't know what's going on. So how we phrase our feedback or suggestions, really, really important. So let me move on to the next letter in the, the safety model, and this is autonomy. And the key lesson here is that we don't like being told what to do. Um, although we can all probably think of times in our lives that we wanted to be told what to do, or there's certain people that seem to want to be told what to do. But the truth is that all of those points aren't really so much that we want to be told how to do things, but we want clarity around what we're being asked to do. And in those cases where we did want those instructions, it's because we wanted the security, the first letter, to, to know exactly what it is we wanted, that real clarity around the problem. Once we have that sense of clarity, again, we don't like being told what to do. So we want autonomy. It's really important. Uh, if we are lacking autonomy, we start to feel unsafe. Um, we've, there's a body of research showing that uh, having little or no control leads to a state of learned helplessness. We've, we've probably all seen this. Uh, has major impact to our health, depression, anxiety, stress, etc. So autonomy is a really big deal. Now, as a bit of a side note here, I would also call out that autonomy is key to motivation as well. So although what we're talking about here is all about psychological safety and the survival mechanism, motivation is also really important. And autonomy is key to motivation. As I'm sure you've, you've all heard or seen the, the, uh, the talk that Dan Pink gives, where he talks about uh, autonomy, mastery, and purpose, autonomy being a key piece there. Uh, if you want to read something that is a little bit more on the psychological side, getting into the, the actual medicine and neuroscience, then self-determination theory is the, the scientific way of looking at all of that, whereas Dan Pink gets a lot more into the sort of the pop culture side of it. Fairness is really interesting. If we perceive something to be unfair, it activates a part of our brain called the ancillar insula. And the, the insula then inhibits the prefrontal cortex. So when we perceive that something is unfair, somebody didn't get a raise when they should have, somebody didn't get the recognition that they should have, uh, something went on that just wasn't fair, that actually inhibits um, our, uh, our prefrontal cortex. Okay, did I just lose you? This just decided to stop. Well, we can still see you. It's just not in presentation mode anymore. All right, we're back. Okay, perfect. Well, that doesn't that sticky note doesn't want to move, so it's just going to stay there. All right, so uh, we get all these different things around uh, uh, unfairness. Uh, fairness, on the other hand, when we uh, observe something that is fair, we actually get a reward. We get a shot of dopamine, which is another neurotransmitter that is very important. It's our reward and it encourages us to do the right thing. But perceiving something as being unfair, whether we do something unfair, we perceive something unfair, something unfair happens to us, it inhibits the prefrontal cortex, which makes us feel less safe. And that's a really interesting thing. I don't even have to be the, the recipient of the unfairness for me to feel less safe. Okay, so our social status, esteem, is how we fit into our social status, how we feel about ourselves, what our, where, where we stand in the, in the organization, in our social groups, because our social status was directly connected to our survival over an evolutionary perspective. We found that if we were part of the group, if the group respected us and, and held us up, uh, that they would protect us. And if we were kicked out of the group, then we were on our own and our chances of survival would go down significantly. So esteem is very tightly connected to our survival mechanism. 
Mike, uh, Mike, we're still on the fairness slide. Are you? Okay. Well, I'm going to stop sharing and start sharing again. Are you looking at a steam now? Yes, we're good. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you for calling that out. Uh, so a couple of things here. Uh, one really interesting study that showed that disapproving facial expressions from other people can trigger the amygdala or survival mechanism even more than fear does. And that's an astounding statement because the amygdala is all about fear. Uh, and the, the other study that was interesting is that social rejection has or challenge uh, has the same impact to brain as physical pain. Uh, in the, this, the research study there, they actually looked at how people deal with physical pain, so taking painkillers, and they found that painkillers actually work with social pain just as well as they do with physical pain. Really interesting stuff. So in any case, esteem is tightly connected to our survival. We get on to the next one, which is trust. And this is where our brains are hardwired. We often talk about us versus them, but in a psychological context, we talk about in-groups and out-groups. So our in-groups are those who are like me and our out-groups are people who are not like me in whatever characteristic. And we automatically distrust those who are different from us. Anybody who's in our out-group, we automatically distrust them. But our prefrontal cortex, when it's active, is able to override that, is able to say, no, no, it's okay. I can start to work with this person. I can start to do things even though they're different from me. Maybe they come from a different culture. They look different. They sound different. But my prefrontal cortex can override that and say, yes, I can still work with these people. When my prefrontal cortex is inhibited, all of a sudden I, I start to distrust and fear those people who are different from me. So this sort of reinforces itself that as the prefrontal cortex gets shut down a little bit, now we trust even less. And then as our trust goes down, we, the prefrontal cortex gets inhibited again. So it, it becomes a, a bit of a, a negative loop. Okay, so having trust calms the amygdala, just like we talked about with oxytocin before. So if I, have, if I trust you or you trust me, then we get a flow of oxytocin in both cases. So if I trust you, we both get a bit of oxytocin. You trust me, we both get a bit of oxytocin. Fascinatingly, that I get a shot of oxytocin, even if you trust me, but I don't trust you in return. I still get that shot of oxytocin just because you trusted me. Interesting situation. So having trust in our environment, if we can build up that trust, then it releases the oxytocin, we start to get uh, the better, start to calm the amygdala. Um, a little bit more into the psychology rather than the neuroscience, but this is Stephen Covey of Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. He talks about the cost of not having trust and how it adds a, a hidden tax on every transaction. So it, not having that trust is bad on so many levels, but from a psychological safety level, it really hurts us. It causes the prefrontal cortex to be inhibited when we don't have trust. And when we do have trust, we get that oxytocin that calms the amygdala. So trust is a central point. Then we get to the last one, which is just sort of a placeholder. This is all of those individual variables that make us all up. And the, the interesting thing is that the, the unique things about each of us can actually override the previous five Things. So we've got all of these factors to take into account, and yet we're all individually different. So there's no single right thing that we can all do to make things better or make things necessarily worse. So let's stop for really quickly here, see if there's any questions so far. Okay, so no questions. So what we're gonna do is now I've given you a ton of information. Um, well, we're going to go into breakout rooms and what I want you to do is I want you to start brainstorming either some situations where you've seen these things get worse or some things we could do in our environments, whether at your company and other companies where we could sort of make things better 
to mitigate those problems of psychological safety. So we're gonna go into six different breakout rooms and I'm going to ask, you're gonna cycle through it with as much time as we have. And we're gonna see how much time we have left for this. We're gonna go through and if you start in the security group, I want you to sort of brainstorm things that you might be able to do that would make things better. Now, I'm gonna give you a link in the chat to this mural board so that you can join me here. So if everybody could join me on the board, we're gonna come down here, we're gonna put everybody in breakout rooms. The reason I've done this on a mural board is because you might want to refer back to all the information that we had before. We had a lot of content and I realized there was a lot, but I put a lot of content on the slides because you might want to refer back to it. So once we get into breakout rooms, you'll see that each room here has up in the top right corner, which room should be there. So security breakout room one is going to start in this room. Breakout room two is going to start in the autonomy room. Breakout room three will start in fairness, et cetera, all the way around. Once you and your group have come up with enough ideas, when you say, we've discussed autonomy enough, we don't need to talk about it anymore, just move along on your own to the next one and just follow the arrows and circle around. And my hope is that by the time we're done, we'll have ideas written up on all of these spots. Okay, so let's get everybody, if you have questions, let me know now. I'm going to start setting up breakout rooms. Six breakout rooms automatically created. Okay, any questions before we go into rooms? All right, well, I will pop in and around the rooms. If you have any questions, let me know. Let's just brainstorm, come up with some ideas, things that you think would be a good thing to try or, or situations that you've seen where these problems have come up. And then once we have we spend a bit of time on this, then we'll all come back to the main room and we'll talk through some more, we'll debrief it, and then I'll send you all references for all kinds of books and citations and such. All right, so have some fun with it. Welcome back. We're just going to really quickly uh, walk through these. If you haven't, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on what was written, but if you have any questions, then uh, please stop me. For security, uh, meeting cadence consistency. So this is building on consistency. Um, Self-esteem increases sense of security. That's true. I would have put it over on the esteem bucket, but they are, they are a little bit connected. Uh, reviewable agenda prior to call allows folks to prepare. Be dependable, not flaky. Provide goal to aim for and don't prescribe how to accomplish that under autonomy requires safety and helps with safety. Highly individual requires coaching companies from managers and lots of attention to one-on-one. -on -one. Hear from everybody, distribute decision-making, has the dimensions of self-development and self-knowledge slash awareness. Under fairness, well, be fair, yes. Be open and transparent, uh, treat people equally, no, no favoritism, no discrimination, give others opportunity. Yes. All easy things to say and harder to do, but yes, we need to, to really make an effort at fairness. Uh, for esteem, um, explicit invitations to calls, meetings, etc. Excuse yourself from being on camera if body language or facial expressions aren't welcoming. Positive reinforcement of expressions of appreciation, kudos, and call outs. Respect people. Give credit to others for their ideas and contributions. Appreciations, positive affirmations, recognition, respect. Improve your own self-esteem. Satir, yes. Satir, the Virginia Satir uh, material is brilliant. Um, I can probably guess who wrote that particular one here, but there is, there's a lot to be learned from Virginia Satir. Uh, trust, give yourself a benefit of doubt, trust yourself. Forgive and forget past, keep your word, apologize for your mistakes. Takes time to build, can reverse easily, find common interest using an icebreaker. Yes, yes, excellent one down here in the bottom right. I'll give you an example. I did that at a, at a uh, workshop not too long ago. Uh, it wasn't my workshop, but the, we were given sort of a bingo sheet and we had to do things like 
you know, have a cat would be one of them. And well, I do have a cat. And so I would have to find somebody else in the room who also had a cat. And as we started to do these, we started to build in groups. Because again, psychology says we have in-groups and out-groups. And so as we start to find common interests, we build more of those in-groups, which makes me trust instinctively more. It's a really good and positive thing. Uh, do not see intention behind mistakes. Okay, self-aware. Uh, under you, being aware of the other five, yes. Being present, past experiences and acknowledging our biases. How are we presenting ourselves? being honest with ourselves, our biases and triggers, open enough to become comfortable to ask questions about self or the situation, self-reflect, self-learning, strengthen your own self-esteem. Again, the Virginia Satir uh, toolkit, uh, which is fabulous stuff and self-care. Any other thoughts that were not captured here? Any surprises maybe? No? All right. Then let's get on to the part, as I said before, I feel it's really important, given that I am not a neuroscientist, that I be able to back up all the things that I say. And so you will find that these books in particular, really, I found useful for this, this work. I read a lot of neuroscience that are not listed here. These are the ones that were relevant for safety, very specifically for psychological safety. Uh, these citations over here, are all the things from the quotes above. So any place there was a quote and it said some person and a year, these are the things that match up to it. Some of them are books, some of them are research papers, some of them are videos. But these are links back to the actual research from the people who are credible in that space. Um, the only book that I threw in here that was not actually referenced um, is this one over here, The Worst is Over, which is a fascinating book on language patterns and how they work uh, how they they affect what we do in our in our uh, in our brains. Uh, we are language is so important to what we do, and we, I could spend a whole another evening talking about that. But this is a fascinating book on how the the choice of language can actually make the difference between life and death situations. Uh, they they ran uh, a bunch of studies with paramedics where they gave them a new script to read to patients. And when they read that new script, there were better outcomes. There was a higher survival rate when they went to the hospital. There were faster recovery times. Language is critically important. So these two are all about language. Uh, these two are all about motivation. And then this is just general neuroscience. Um, the one that I mentioned that made me laugh out loud was Seven and a Half Lessons About the Brain. It is the only neuroscience book to date that has made me laugh out loud. And then this is me. Uh, with a bunch of links to other stuff I write. Um, as you can tell by now, I'm fascinated by how the brain works and, and psychology and neuroscience and all of those things. And I write about how that interfaces with Agile at unconsciousagile.com. Um, I also do have uh, workshops on anti-anxiety tools and there's all that stuff up on Unconscious Agile. So I will export this entire board so you have access to it. And I guess we'll get this link out to you. I'll send, I'll send the link to this to Fadi in probably another 10, 15 minutes. And then he can send it out to everybody. Is that okay? Mike, this is Raghu. Um, I'm not sure if you can hear me, okay? Yes, yep. go ahead. Sorry, I, I just joined uh, maybe 20 minutes late. I'm not sure if you um, mentioned, um, what, I, what is the last name? Emmy from HBS. Harvard Business School, who, mm -hmm. who talks a lot about psychological safety. Amy um, Edmondson. Edmondson. Yes. Yeah. Um, did you, um, what, do you, what do you think about her work? And what she well, she's the one who coined the term in the first place. She's the one who initially discovered it. And yeah. then other people are adding to her work. So yes, she's, she's been there right from the beginning. And she's doing some really interesting stuff with it. Got it. <clears throat> I don't actually think I referenced her book on here. You did not. That's why I was curious. Not, yeah, because yeah. because she doesn't come at it from the neuroscience perspective. She comes at it from the, the psychological behavioral 
which is still very valid, but that wasn't where I wanted to go tonight. Got it. So I was prepared to be bored out of my skull, but this has been very, very good. Thank you so much. Oh, you're very <laughs> welcome. I'm glad to disappoint you in that way. Yeah, I think uh, I think the psychological safety is uh, one of the most important things um, to really help organizations thrive. So it's something that always becomes more top of mind. I read uh, Amy Edmonds' book, Edmondson's book, uh, recently. So it's a good book. Yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting topic, but unfortunately what I find is that most discussions around this tend to just be platitudes. It, yes, we should have more of it, do more of it, without a lot of concrete specifics. Well, what's actually going on? What concrete things could we do to make things better? And that's what I was hoping to address here. Mm -hmm. Mike, not to monopolize, but um, if you were to have a prescription I'm not asking you to, but if you had these six elements and you are uh, working with a new team, where would you start? Which of those six elements is easier to approach? Well, the why, I've, I guess, yeah. I'm not starting with necessarily a specific element. I might start with specific practices that hit multiples. So if I was, for example, starting a team on mob programming, that's going to hit both trust and security at the same time. Uh, it might also hit autonomy. So I'm going to be looking for practices that are going to hit multiples of these all at the same time. Got it. W would it be a little bit overwhelming for a team if you start all at once? Well, if I told them that I'm trying to do multiple things at once, then yes. But if I'm just saying, hey, I want to show you this new way of working. Why don't we try mob mobbing together? Uh, they're, all they think they're doing is they think they're learning a new skill. But in fact, I'm actually driving home a number of things around security, trust, autonomy, fairness. So I'm not, yes, they'd be overwhelmed if I told them what I was actually doing. What if I told them my ulterior motives? Right. But instead, I'm just going to say, hey, let's try this new technique. But you're talking about the team you're already working with. Or or not? Yes, if the team that I am actively working with. This is how okay. I would approach things. But I'd also look and see where where they need things. I mean, maybe autonomy is not an issue for them. Okay, well, I'll start somewhere else. Sorry, I cut you off. Go ahead. No, no, no. I was just curious because I kind of had an uh, opportunity for a job, and it was kind of uh, really high 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 profile government position uh high profile gov government job and uh they put me in front of the client and the, the reason i didn't get the job is because i don't have as much experience as, as client needed mm -hmm. uh, but I, I i went through like you know three interviews and and i i assumed that they would not put anyone up front in front of the client so i was trying to figure out you know how would i i already started like having some thoughts in my head and I kind of knew about the teams and, you know, what they struggle. So my first thought was building trust. And then how do you build trust with, with, uh, with the team that have been working together for a while? Yeah, they do have some struggles, but you are the, that new guy. And, you know, by, by default, it could happen that they really won't uh, uh, trust you from, from, from the get-go. And, you know, how do you overcome that? Like you, you go there and then you say, hey, guys, like I'm here to help and you can trust me, but you actually have to show them. So like I'm curious, you know, Raghu ask really good question, you know, how do you start? So I'm curious, yeah. how is that with, with the well, team? Well, in, in the case of trust, I'm looking to build in groups. Well, what's common? You know, what, what are the things that we all like to do? Well, you know, here's mm -hmm. some things I like to do. Are those things you're interested in? Let's start to build some relationships. We're trying to, to form more and more in-groups. And sometimes we do it explicitly, like with the bingo sheet that I talked about. And sometimes it's just more casual conversations. Okay, so icebreakers. Or you share about yourself 
the more they start to realize, hey, maybe I've got something in common with you. You, yeah. you don't want it to be too forced. You know, I, I, I've worked with people who really try to force this issue and try to force the, the building trust. But if it's more organic, you know, this is who I am. These are the things that I'm interested in. And somebody might say, hey, I'm also interested in that. Let's talk about it. Yeah. The first thing I do when I'm going to be working with a new team is I schedule just a one-on-one 30-minute conversation, introduce myself, and then I ask questions not about work, but about them. And, you know, what do they do outside of work? You know, do they have any hobbies? Do, you know, do they have family? You know, what do they, what do they enjoy? So you just get to know them more on a personal level. And uh, that's just the starting point, right? But, and then, you know, you share about yourself as well. So it, especially in this kind of Zoom COVID world, you know, we just don't have the chance to connect in person to person and face to face. Something that I do that you, you might find useful is that I always, the background that I have behind me is always someplace I've recently hiked. And People don't realize that at first. They just realize, oh, it's a, it's a pretty picture of more mountains or, or forest, or in this case, fall colors. But as they notice that I'm changing my background every couple of weeks, they start asking questions. Oh, where was that? Where did you find that picture? Oh, well, I took this when I was out hiking. Now we're starting to have a conversation. We're starting to build some trust because I've done something interesting. I know other people who have done the same thing. So one coach I work with is an avid skier. So he's constantly changing to, to ski pictures in the background. That's a great idea. I find it interesting because I mentioned to clients that, you know, that's how I would start, you know, building trust by doing one-on-one and by doing icebreakers. And, you know, I, I understand that I don't have enough experience, you know, but uh, to, it was, It, you know, it was interesting. I didn't get the opportunity after that many interviews. Yeah. Just on the subject of icebreakers, I, I just will point out that some people really don't like icebreakers and feel uncomfortable with them. And then you're triggering the survival mechanism the other way. And you're creating okay. distrust. So you need to be really careful. Some groups love icebreakers and some just don't. And you need to be really careful about that. I find it easier for me to reveal things about myself rather than asking them to reveal things about themselves. So Mm -hmm. I'll say, you know, I went hiking in this place and somebody else might say, oh, I like hiking or, you know, I don't like hiking at all. Okay, well, now I've learned something. What do you think about the icebreaker too? It's just not a, a set icebreaker exercise, which is what puts people off. It's just making contact and having conversation. That's a form of icebreaker. Mm -hmm. Right. What, what do you think about liberating structures? Uh, there's a lot of good things in there, but it's a big grab bag to really say, do I like it or not? There, there's a lot of stuff in there. Yes. Um, is it right for your situation? If what you're trying to do is build trust, liberating structures is probably not the place I'd start. To George's point, I'd just be having a conversation. So I put a link into a, uh, an article Esther Derby wrote on entering groups, which is, uh, she's, she's written a lot on, on that. I don't, I don't know all, all the links to her writings on it. I've talked with her a lot on it also, but uh, she's a good person to listen to on that topic. Mike, I, I put a question in the chat. Um, is there any instrument or some kind of um, questionnaire set that enables you to assess where a team is in all the, on these six dimensions? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Okay. Not, not an easy the- thing. The book does go into examples of, you know, here's somebody who has a high need for security versus here's somebody who has a low need for securities. So it's got lots of different scenarios that would help you, but it's not a direct assessment. Got it. That's the Radeki, Radeki's book, yeah? Yes. Okay, thanks. 
All right. Well, if there's no more questions, um, my contact information is there if anybody has any questions uh, after the fact. But otherwise, thank you for your time tonight.